All right. Um, thank you, everybody, for um, joining us uh, here today um, for this uh, policy forum, uh, the first uh, policy forum that the McKell Institute really has done in person um, since the, the end of uh, the lockdowns that we've had here in um, here, here in Victoria. So I'm quite excited, <laughs> to be honest, to be um, out and about and doing things uh, in person here again. So thank you very much for joining us. My name is Ryan Batchelor. Uh, I'm the Executive Director of the McKell Institute here in Victoria. For those of you who may be not familiar with our work, we're an uh, independent uh, not-for-profit research institute. Um, what many of you may know as a think tank, um, whose mission is to uh, engage in public policy debate, um, particularly here in Victoria, to look at Victorian issues, but we've got offices in Sydney, uh, Brisbane and Adelaide, so we obviously um, think about issues uh, amongst the states and also at a national level. Um, and one of the things that we're really interested in is how we can think about innovative solutions to contemporary public policy challenges and that's our overarching uh, overarching mission and one of the reasons why we're really, really interested in, in engaging in today's debate. Um, can I begin uh, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands we're meeting on here today. We're meeting on Wurundjeri country um, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and to acknowledge um, the continuing role that uh, the Wurundjeri people have in caring for this country and the important role that they and other Aboriginal Victorians are playing um, in what I think for those of us who are uh, who may be watching this presentation later uh, or joining us from interstate, the really leading way that Victoria um, is taking forward its relationship with its First Nations people uh, through the treaty and truth processes that are underway right now. And I think it's important in forums like this to acknowledge that um, there's a lot of really interesting and important work being done um, to both recognise, um, tell the truth and heal and think about how we take the relationship that we have with our First Nations people forward. I also wanted to, um, before I introduce uh, today's panel and speak a little bit about what we're going to be talking about here today, also to acknowledge that it's International Nurses Day um, and uh, a good day to be talking about what the future healthcare challenges are. Um, so we probably also should say thank you to all the nurses out there. Um, those of us who are joining us here today, and I'll introduce Kirsten in a minute, but to the others um, who've been working tirelessly throughout um, this pandemic. Um, just a couple of housekeeping matters as well. Um, there's sandwiches and food at the back, uh, uh, tea and coffee facilities. Please feel free um, to eat. Um, we want to make sure that uh, you guys aren't sitting there on an empty stomach and letting those tasty sandwiches go to waste. Um, there's bathrooms out um, by uh, out, out, outside the front door. Um, we are recording today's uh, proceedings because we want to have a record of, of the conversation. We think for those who couldn't make it here in person today, it'd be, it's a good opportunity. Um, if anyone's concerned about that, come and talk to us. There's um, collection statements that are on your table. So if you want to get up and ask a question, um, uh, we, you'll be captured on camera. Um, uh, so just um, un understand that. Um, so we've joined by um, some uh, important voices here today um, in, in this conversation really to bring a diversity of perspectives. And so I thought I might introduce the panellists to you from, I don't know whether that's left or right from where you're sitting, but from this end to that end. Um, Kirsten Davidson um, is, is joining us. Uh, Kirsten's an experienced clinical nurse consultant at the Royal Children's Hospital, um, working as both a nurse and a nurse educator, um, working on the EMR and informatics team. Um, for those of you like me who find the world of acronyms bewildering, Kirsten, I assume that's electronic medical records. That's right, good. She also um, uh, has a clinical nursing role working across a number of specialist teams. Um, so we're interested in getting her perspective from both of those um, here today. Beside me is Dr. Roderick McRae. Dr. McRae is a... Um, a consultant anesthetist and intensive care physician at Monash Health and also, um, interestingly and importantly for today's discussion, the Victorian um, president of the AMA um, and holds a long list of other important jobs um, and which I won't go through in detail, but to understand that both from a uh, uh, 
practicing uh, clinician's perspective, physician's perspective, but also as a representative of the medical profession um, and engaged in a number of key, um, uh, key uh, health policy uh, bodies. We're really interested in the conversation and the contribution that um, uh, Roderick will bring today. Sitting next to me here is Dr. Angela Jackson. Um, Angela is uh, the lead economist at Impact Economics, a uh, health economist um, who's served previously for six years on the board of Royal Melbourne Hospital. Um, so it's got some views from a governance and um, uh, uh, academic perspective, I should say, although practical academic, I would say, rather than a... Um, uh, and Angela, I should declare that Andrew and I worked together previous, in a previous life when she um, was the Deputy Chief of Staff to the Finance Minister uh, in the Commonwealth Government um, some years ago. Um, and Brett Newstead from, is a director with Zebra Technologies here in Australia, and in that role he advises healthcare providers on how they can um, efficiently address the key issue of of healthcare worker fatigue um, by using mobile technologies um, and to digitise processes to um, facilitate um, uh, better outcomes in, in healthcare. And from the McKell Institute, we're really proud that Zebra Technologies is partnering with us to bring today's discussion to you. So we want to thank both Brett for participating, but also Zebra Technologies for um, helping us put on today's discussion. Basically, the format today is that I'm going to ask each of the panellists to say a few words, give a bit of an introduction on the theme about how, um, how we, what are the challenges facing the Victorian healthcare system beyond the pandemic? What's coming next? What do we think those challenges are? Um, and how do we deal with them? Um, by way of scene setting, I think that um, we've, we're certainly uh, meeting for this discussion at a very interesting time. Um, I think, from our perspective, when you put some of this in the in the material, there's certainly um, what we're seeing post-pandemic is a real surge in demand and healthcare demand, um, both from the pressures that accumulated and the um, uh, the issues that, are, that 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 are facing us as a result of the pandemic itself, but then also the impact that um, deferred treatment. Um, people's inability to access the system during periods of lockdown or reprioritisation and what that's meaning for, um, uh, for patients. Um, the other big issue I think that we're facing is, is on, a, on the staffing side that uh, healthcare workers, both everyone from the consultants, the doctors, the nurses, through to the other types of orderlies and other support staff that work in our hospitals, have just been doing a, a Herculean job in the last couple of years. And we are seeing more and more um, stories in the paper today and previously about the impact that that's had um, on our healthcare workforce. And so I think there's a real challenge there in figuring out how we deal with that. And the other issue I think that's confronting us is that um, there's budgetary pressures that um, across the board, both you know here in Victoria, but also nationally, um, there are uh, pressures on, on, on our government budgets, their pressures on health budgets, and figuring out how we deal with those challenges and how we make sure that the, the, the system is able to deliver what the patients need um, as we move forward in a, in, a, in a complex and challenging fiscal environment is another, another thing which we, um, I think, is worth considering and worth discussing. That's kind of all I wanted to do by way of scene setting. There's obviously been a lot happening um, contextually here in Victoria with the Victorian state budget. Uh, I'd say a couple of weeks ago. Um, we've got a federal election in 10 days time. Um, that's coming very soon. So there's, there's, there's a lot happening, there's a lot going on. Um, and what I want to get out of today and what we want to get out of today is a really interesting conversation amongst our panellists, but then also from you, um, the audience members, with a bit of Q&A after we've had a bit of a discussion up here. So we'd really encourage you to be thinking about some of the questions that you might like to ask um, ask us um, uh, as we take this discussion forward. Um, so I might start, Kirsten, if I can, by um, getting you to pick that microphone up. Um, and maybe you can just give us, uh, I don't think you didn't, don't need to do anything to it. I think it works perfectly. Um, that's the theory anyway. If you can just maybe give us a perspective um, from where you are as a, as a nurse, as a lead nurse, um, on what the, your experiences of the pandemic how you think the system has 
coped, how it's adjusted, and what you think some of the, the challenges that we've, we're facing going forward are. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I work on a busy surgical unit um, as part of my clinical role. I've done that for over 25 years. So I've seen healthcare change in that time and our families and our patients. From a nursing perspective, the pandemic has put a big spotlight on the value of nurses in the system. Um, and also our families and the community are really valuing nurses and the impact nurses have in, in care. But possibly our hospitals and the machine of public health really doesn't show that we really value those nurses in a way by the environment we're working in. And that might mean that potentially we don't have the right tools. What do we need to enable us to deliver good care? Um, we really need to be able to really have that time to care. And how do we how do we help nurses to release them from low value tasks, tasks that take time, documentation that's not effective, processes that aren't required really that en don't enable me to be at the bedside and deliver that care that those patients and families deserve. And from a healthcare perspective from me, from a clinician, I feel torn when I can't provide that care, that care that that really is expected of me um, to be able to be provided for my patients. Um, from an EMR perspective, so I have an interesting um, other role from an EMR and an analytics perspective. How are we using the EMR? We've had an EMR since 2016 to enable efficiencies to release nurses to for that time to care. But also on International Nurses Day, which is the theme is nurses, um, a voice to lead, how are we um, enabling nurses to have nurse-led care, how to create capacity in the system? So we're sort of transformed some of the way we care in the pandemic, but we haven't gone the full way. Where there's so many opportunities to have nurse-led care, to release nurses, um, to be enabling care? Can we care for children closer to home? Can we re have recovery methods at home where a nurse does a follow-up call to create capacity in the hospital. I think there's lots of ways nurses will know how to fix some of the things in the system to create capacity, especially in public health, but also how do we use technology and the data we've collected to have predictive models of care? What informs our care? How do we um, use the EMR and informatics to say, okay, after day two, this is safe for this patient to be transitioned to home? We've got data since 2016, but we're really not tapping into that. Um, as part of our efficiencies at the Children's, we introduced a handheld mobile device um, that enables nurses to document at the point of care. And we've had some really great um, satisfaction from nurses. They're happy because my care is enabled. I can document at the point of care. I don't have to go outside the patient room to find a computer and log on and do the care I need to do or document the care. They have this device that enables scanning for safety. We're keeping our patients safe with the device. Um, and we've used leveraged all the um, elements of our EMR to enable those nurses to be much more efficient at, at providing care. But we actually had to have insight and a strategy for nursing. We had to say we want our nurses to be mobile. We want our nurses to be able to provide care at the bedside, in the car park, doing those immunisations, collecting those specimens and also in the home. And we're using that one device to enable that as well. Thanks, Kirsten. Roderick, if I can ask you next, um, from where you sit both with, with both of your hats on, I suppose, as a, as a clinician and as a leader, in the um, in the healthcare system, what do you think the some of these key pressures are that we're seeing um, right now in healthcare? Yeah, thank you. And first, I'd like to also uh, pay my respects to the elders, past, present, and emerging, and their custodianship of the land upon which we meet. And also uh, express my gratitude on International Nurses Day. Um, even in that in Kirsten's presentation, there's just so much we could talk about. Some would be controversial and others would not. So in, to perhaps summarise, we're in the middle of an unbelievable disaster and we're having a nice lunch. And, and that's part of the difficulty because everybody is trying to wish away a global pandemic. You know, if I said, put your hands up if you think it's all gone and finished, I would hope nobody moves because I can't overstate how stressful it is. It, because it's a crisis, it seems such a shame to waste it. 
So AMA has uh, done a lot of work with government trying to improve things. And it's across, we, we picked four key areas. Primary care, or you'd know it as general practice. Mental health, and that's across public, private, and everywhere in between. Uh, the catching up with the lack of uh, patient care, and I can assure you at the end, in 25 years, the number of people who've had significant mortality or well, morbidity, I should have said, mortality being very significant, <laughs> and mortality as a consequence of their deferred care or something they didn't reach is going to way outnumber the people who have certainly died from and even um, had significant morbidity, perhaps as we translate a little bit into long COVID, going to completely outnumber it. And then there's the public hospital system itself. And we very much support the Victorian state government's budget initiatives. There was a lot of money, $12 billion. That's playing catch up for, I've been in the system 35 years. Uh, I know I only look like I'm 27, but um, throughout that time, there's been a lack of investment and capacity. We champion migration. We welcome the doubling of the population of Melbourne, for example, over the last eight to 12 years. We haven't doubled the hospital capacity. We've relied on people like Kirsten and myself to run the hamster wheel that little bit faster. So 20 years ago, if you came in to have a major procedure, you'd come in two days before. 15 years ago, the night before, you'd meet, you'd think, you'd do that, and you'd have your procedure. Today, if you're 85 years of age, uh, you, and you live in Swan Hill, you go to the Royal Melbourne Hospital, you'll be invited to come in at four in the morning, doesn't matter about other conditions, and just get in there and get out with the hope that nothing goes wrong. And most of the time, nothing major goes wrong, but there's always a little bit of a, a thing. We're gonna hear, I understand, from health economists, we've got problems with funding arrangements. I believe there are problems with the electronic medical record. But one thing I wanna say is, out of this crisis, we have got to do stuff differently. One fantastic thing the Victorian government did after a lot of negotiation and, and encouragement was to get primary care general practitioners to vaccinate people for COVID-19 in their community, in their cultural groups, because we weren't getting the patients and the doctors and the vaccine all in the same room at once. And the sales pitch was it's an investment. By paying uh, into a practice to do that, $5,000, that meets, and then vaccinating 50 to 150 people, that's one admission to one intensive care unit. So Australia has done extraordinarily well, and in our circumstances today, are related to the pandemic and COVID-19, and we look very good, our mortality is fantastic on a global scale, but believe it or not, we're not adequately vaccinated. We've got about the best in the world, it's not enough. We're in the middle of a federal election campaign, as we've heard, and I have heard nothing related to health care, and yet there's a fundamental expectation that the federal government works kind of in private, general practice, private specialist practice, and the public hospital is supported by the state government. And it's almost as if they're black and blue, two completely different colours, different things, but it is so interwoven so we need to do something differently. And I think it's to start exploiting the digital technologies, the outreach. We need more bricks and mortar. And it's not just the infrastructure, it's got to be the population or the workforce to support that. And it needs to be in a ratio. So technically, I'm only interested in doctors. If you review what I've said, I refer to healthcare workers. Because for one of me, you probably need 16 nurses, two radiographers, eight physiotherapists, and so it goes on. And it's got to be in a coordinated balance. I'm very supportive of the concept of recruitment of healthcare workers, as has been uh, advocated in the budget, but it's not helping anybody tonight. And I can assure you it's a crisis tonight. And part of it is there are the wrong people in our acute tertiary type metropolitan public hospitals who don't need to be there. But they are, and it's a failure of the integration between management from the federal sphere and the government sphere. So they're essentially hotel uh, requiring people, but they're not getting their assessments, whether it's NDIS, 
for residential aged care facilities, <coughs> 900 people are sitting in your hospitals, literally, well, perhaps they're semi-recumbent, but that's all they're doing. And it's okay because the nursing staff are looking after them, but they don't need to. They should be looking after a different type of patient with those infrastructure resources. It's very, very complex. We had surge capacity management, and so a lot of industrial terms were kind of thrown out the window, and that was a good thing. It's a good national or state-based thing to do for the workforce, but enough's enough. I'm aware of medical staff and nursing staff and allied health staff, particularly in the emergency departments, being physically abused, being mentally abused, and I can understand it. If I had a bone sticking out of my leg, I'd be sore and I'd be angry, and what do you mean I've got to wait 15 hours? But there are so many things, there are so many moving parts, it's almost too daunting to contemplate. But I think we can get there, but we have to do stuff differently. Thanks very much. Uh, Angela, if I can, having sort of heard from uh, Kirsten and Roderick about um, the pressures that the, that the sisters, that the um, that workers are under and what they're facing, what do you think is confronting the system? And how, at a system level, do you think um, government needs to think about and, and players within the system itself, not just, not just the responsibility of government? Um, how do you think we need to think about these issues from the, system, from the, from the perspective of a health system? Sorry, that's not working. Uh, let alone uh, continuing to work in this crisis environment. And we are in a crisis. Um, and it can be difficult, I think, in a crisis to then think clear-headedly about, well, what are the systematic issues behind that? Um, where I'd go to is, let's go back before the pandemic. These aren't new issues. Um, the pressures were building in our hospital system. Uh, the funding system here in Victoria, the case mix system, was broken, and I think we just need to acknowledge that. Most hospitals in this state had moved to block funding even before the pandemic. That is, case mix funding wasn't adequate, and so they were getting top-ups. It's effectively block funding. So the system was already not working. Uh, we already had the issues in terms of the NDIS that you, you pointed to and that fragmentation where we're seeing delays in terms of... Uh, so, you know, someone has a major trauma or a major deterioration and there's delays in the NDIS assessment. People stay in hospital rather than moving out and that creates problems throughout the system. So that's definitely one thing where I think the Commonwealth in particular um, can really step up and take some pressure at this critical time off the hospital system. But again, these are big issues between the state, the federal, the doctors, the nurses around the general level of fragmentation of our system between those state, those levels of government, um, where we see responsibility, particularly for those with chronic diseases and quite complex chronic diseases who cause a lot of the demand in our system. So they're the long stayers, they're the people who come back regularly. And what we see is that funding between, you know, the, the public hospital system, because they have a lot of involvement from those specialists and the federal government, it isn't it isn't adequate, really, to cover those patients. And you see there's gaps in that care. And so people end up coming back sicker and more regularly. So that's one area, I think, of reform. Then there's private versus public. Uh, and I think that is, you know, it's a, a difficult conversation to have and perhaps one that's more political. But the public system, private system is there, right? It does have capacity. And when I see a public system near breaking point, near breaking point, and I see a private system not near breaking point, in my head I think, well, what, what's going on there? Why are we creating these silos between public and private? and we're not thinking about the capacity across the health system, having a bit bigger thinking, not so based on politics in terms of, you know, and how can we use that capacity as well to, to alleviate some of that pressure? Because we can't expect our public physicians to continue to operate like this. It's not safe. Care isn't safe at the moment. And we have a private system that we could be utilising more, whether that's around elective surgery, whether that's around moving some of these patients in terms of the NDIS, whatever it is, Let's take away our sense of we can't possibly think about this system as a whole health system um, and how it can be best serving our community needs. So that's in terms of where I think 
you know, we need to be thinking about some of that big system reform. Um, and I'll stop talking because I could actually go on all day. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, whoa. Here we go. It's raining microphones. That's good. Um, Brett, from your – you work a lot with healthcare professionals trying to figure out how to make their lives a bit easier through better using technology. Um, having heard what you've heard here and from the work you do more broadly – um, what do you think we can do to make, um, whether it's nursing staff or other medical staff, um, and there's a phrase that, that Kirsten used, giving them more time to care. What do you think we can do to, to facilitate that? So uh, th that's a great question. And um, I guess also thank you to all the healthcare workers out there, especially on uh, International Nursing Day as well. Um, I guess the perspective I can give is in terms of the technology trends that we see and um, I think the technology trends that we're seeing and, and the requests are very similar to some of the topics we've spoken about. Uh, the most common areas that we're seeing is interest in patient safety. Uh, a lot of interest around, around how we can actually help with the wellbeing of healthcare workers because that, that's clearly becoming a challenge. Uh, we're also seeing that there's a, a lot of move to how we can help to safely support people that are maybe treated in their homes, which is kind of topical of what we've covered. Uh, we're also seeing, I guess, some interest around the likes of supply chain and asset utilisation as well from a technology perspective. Um, I'd like to give a little bit of context of where I'm going to go with this in terms of who uh, Zebra Technologies is and, and I don't really want to talk too much about Zebra because this is more about healthcare but um, Zebra Technologies is, is a company that uh, is often not well known but if you look out there you'll find that we're pretty much everywhere. Um, we, we do a lot of work in uh, various industries uh, if you're, you've been at home, you've had a parcel delivered by Australia Post or another global transport company, if you look closely, you'll see it's a Zebra mobile computer that they're using to do that delivery. Um, we do a lot of work in that industry around helping to provide visibility, help the staff that are actually doing the deliveries and have full traceability through their supply chain. If you go into your local supermarket or one of the major retailers, likes of Woolworths or Wes Farmers, and again, if you look closely, you'll see it's a Zebra device, where they're trying to use those to improve the way in which uh, they work with customers coming in, and they want to make sure your everyday shopping items are there to be used. So that might give you a bit of a context of, of who we are. Uh, I'd certainly recommend that you, you look the next time you're in a retail store or you're getting a delivery, uh, it becomes addictive, uh, especially for our team as well. Uh, we may well be the biggest company that you don't know. Um, to give you some context of, of our size uh, and um, who we are, we've been around for 50 years. Uh, our global sales is around about uh, 5.6 billion. We've got almost 10,000 employees across 55 countries. And the reason that we're not so well known is because we focus very hard on purpose-built devices that, that actually suit the needs of each individual market or customer. So for healthcare, what we've done is we've actually added the capability to all of our devices so that they can be cleaned down very, very effectively by all of the cleaning agents you may use in healthcare so there's no risk of spread of bacteria or viruses, um, which is really important when you're getting people in for care and especially if you're looking at the safety of patients because you really don't want people going into hospital and coming out with something else. Um, so that's, that's actually one example of how we try to customise to, to meet the market itself. Uh, the other thing that, that constantly surprises us and, and coming from that, that bigger, broader market is that we often are surprised that an apple that you might buy in your supermarket has more visibility, more traceability than a lot of the medicines, patients and assets in a healthcare facility. And, and that often seems quite crazy. So one of the things I did want to talk about, and this is something that uh, we're seeing more and more, and I think somebody uh, touched on scan for safety earlier, is that in the UK, our UK colleagues have supported the National Health Service in a scan for safety program. Uh, and that's a program where they're using GS1 barcodes to be able to provide traceability of patients and their treatments, their assets and the utilisation, 
Uh, Catherine Coates from GS1 is here today, so if you do get a chance, worth having a chat to Catherine in more detail about that program. But that had some amazing results. Uh, but there's, there's, a, there's a quote in a report, uh, which we can share later on, uh, which basically states that they set out to try to improve the system to be far more efficient, but the most surprising result that came out of it is it had a drastic improvement in patient safety. And those same technologies can make a big difference to the wellbeing of the healthcare workers because they free them up to be able to spend more time with patients. Uh, it gives them the ability to communicate and collaborate with, with the other workers around them. And it takes away a lot of the anxiety of administrating medicines because you know it's precisely tracked that you're giving the right medicine to the correct patient as you're delivering it. So I might leave it there because I know we're running a little bit over, so thank you. Thanks very much, Brett. Um, there was a lot in that from, I suppose, some of the macro issues to some of the micro challenges. Um, a fair few, fair few ideas and solutions in it as well. Uh, fair to say, I've got a list of questions like that could probably take us for the next three or four hours, but that is not my intention. My intention from here is to get a conversation going. So um, uh, I'm going to say there are microphones on your table, so there's probably one now microphone on the table, given I appear to be hogging them all up here. Um, so um, if people are, uh, have got a question that they might like to ask, um, have a think, get ready. Um, I might kick things off here with a question to the panel and then um, throw to uh, you out there to, um, to have a say as well because I think um, these threads of what we see the challenges are and they're very, very clear here in that there's um, both uh, the issue of, of burnout that Roderick talked about um, the issue of increased sort of demand and expectation about the services that people want to be receiving in our in our um, hospital systems that um, that Kirsten um, touched on as well, and how we we take those through to figure out how we make the system better. Because I think, um, and one of the points that Angela made about um, there are opportunities to think. That, well, two things I think taking from her conversation. One is that the system was under a hell of a lot of pressure prior to the pandemic anyway, and the pandemic has just made it a bit worse, a lot worse. Um, but also that um, we probably need to rethink some of the ways that those systems interact, the public-private point, um, how we do those, some of those funding issues. So there's a lot, there's a lot um, in that. I'll Probably I'll start with um, a question riffing off a comment that Roderick made that we can't let the crisis go to waste because I think um, we've got an opportunity. There's clearly an opportunity given the salience of health as an issue for the state government. I think um, you don't need to be uh, a political expert to understand that the state government in its recent budget understood that health is an is as a major issue here in Victoria and that there are six, there is six months to a state election. So there's clearly, um, it's on the minds of our local state leaders. I think there's a question about how much it's on the minds of our federal leaders at the moment, but we'll see how that plays out over the course of the next 10 days. Um, so my question really is, what, what, what do we need to do differently so we don't let this crisis go to waste? What do we think is the key issue that we've really got to pick up and, and, and run with um, oh, all of you, but you could absolutely start if we can. If yeah, what, what can we do? I, I mentioned something that was completely revolutionary and that was uh, the state government investing in primary care, never been done before. Just the expectation would be uh, just try to get people to go to their GP and all that sort of thing. But also, it's a, there are, uh, we've discussed the many moving parts, but they're moving at light speed. So when, when the pandemic was first discovered, uh, people in my job were dying. And so I was pretty nervous, you know, I was six months away on the other side of the planet, but I was pretty nervous about what was going on and a strong advocate for vaccination. For 100 years we've vaccinated, or thereabouts, uh, against stuff and it works. And then it depends if I'm in the emergency department, I am in the operating theatre, I am in the intensive care unit, if I'm in primary care. 
and there was this raft of views, personal opinions, where everybody was in their practice of medicine. And they didn't know if they're in primary care, the person coming in the door was the most rabid anti-vaxxer and going to cough in their face. And guess what? Even in Melbourne, we've had examples of that. You know, rare, but you only need one. And if one person in this room has COVID, asymptomatic, they don't know it, we're all going to get it. If we haven't had it, of course. I'm already meeting people in the medical and uh, healthcare workforce and in the community who've had it twice. You know, how greedy. But this is what's going on. And so nobody knows. So you look after yourself. The federal government, zero out of a million in providing primary care practitioners, and that, that's all healthcare workers, medical, nursing, people going into people's homes with personal protective equipment. Like, unbelievable. The state government, not covered in glory, because I had conversations. And they said, of course, this is the gold standard, and you have to do this. And they go, my God. We've got three hours of equipment. You don't have to do it anymore. So Kirsten and I are working in a ward environment and we had much less protection for ourselves knowing that we're walking into somebody at this stage. They were diagnosed with a very aggressive form of COVID-19, the early alphas and betas. And we had less protection than the guy sweeping a hangar or a factory floor in case a bit of dust came up. Okay, so that's kind of the environment, but it's moved and there's better protection, there's better opportunity, better investment. But it's not flash in primary care. They've had to look after themselves. They've had to go to Bunnings and buy whatever they could find on the shelf. And even then it's pretty ordinary. So we have to not discard these. And interesting, if you go back 100 years, look on the library shelves, blow that, another form of dust off. It's all been in, done before and we've ignored it because we want to. Today, or earlier in the week, I uh, read a newspaper article. Time to get out there. Go to the movies. Here's the test ben best movies to see. Go to the movies. You're going to get COVID. Get on the train. Go to the footy. And so in the healthcare workforce space, we are, we're not dropping like flies. We're not dying, but we are getting sick. And many of us have children in primary schools. Uh, the education system is out of control. The business community aren't interacting. I have had zero conversations with anyone in business. I hear them on the TV, catch a plane, do this, go out, go to, go to dinner. And I've had no conversations with education. And I can tell you, in the particularly primary school classrooms, a child here gets COVID, goes right around the room, think of it, one big table, comes back, they get it again. And the teacher is under a bus, who cares? The teacher goes home to Kirsten, who then gets it, furloughed from work. Kirsten or I don't turn up at work. And so the cycle just repeats. And there's nothing more important in Melbourne today than going to the footy. So that's the problem that we've got. Two universes. So the good news is the whole theory about the multiverse is correct. There are two of them in Melbourne, in Victoria, today. Kirsten, if I might just ask you before I go to the floor, what, what do you think we need to do differently? Like, out of the experience that you've had, um, what is it that you think we could change in healthcare, big or small, that would really make your job a lot easier? Oh, I really think... Um you really need to ask nurses what they need to do their jobs correctly and properly. But also there needs to be a big investment um, in terms of money, um, in uh, technology that helps us, enables us to do our job properly. Um, so it would be device integration, all these things that would free up me to actually provide that care. But also our hospital that I work in and I've worked in for a long time, we've transformed some of the ways we care for children, but we haven't transformed all of them. So we moved swiftly to telehealth, really swiftly in the pandemic because it forced that. And then we stopped with our transformation. I was thinking, oh, this is such an exciting time to be a nurse. One, I'm seeing this transformation of care. We're providing care in a different way. We're moving children more to hospital in the home, but then we've really stopped and we've stalled does take money and investment, but it takes that insight and that you have to be brave in a way, 
Um, how can we deliver care differently f that's not in a hospital, but how do we en enable nurses to be leading that care? Because it is important for nurses to lead care and we know we provide good quality care. But how do we engage nurses in wanting to be involved in those strategies. I don't think we're ever asked, really, sometimes. Um, from a hospital perspective, yes, I'm a clinical nurse consultant. I lead EMR from a nursing perspective alongside a CNIO. But do we can see all these opportunities in the hospital to use informatics and our EMR to improve efficiencies, but we fight to get those happening. We had to go to a foundation to get funding for our handheld device. How can that be sustainable um, for care. The nurses need that to deliver their efficient, safe patient care. We had to go to the foundation to get funding for that. You know, we were using a device from 2016. No one uses a mobile phone from 2016, but we're expecting a nurse to use that device to deliver safe medication administration. So really, I think we need to look at the resources we have. We need to have more vision for nursing and efficiencies and nursing models of care, patient care, to create capacity in the system. I think that's really interesting. I think that vision and combining the, the vision that we want to have with this um, moment where fast transformation and accelerators of change have really come to us, we can harness the good part of those of this experience and demonstrate that we can actually change fast when we need to, so long as we're changing in the right way and heading in that heading in that right direction. Yeah, yeah, of course. All, all of the time. Um, I guess just to, to really put it on the record, there are several things going on at once. And so there's what's happening right now. The Victorian budget is looking into this sort of two months to four years period, and it really needs to be reproduced, but you betcha everyone else is going to have a crack. And uh, I've made the point, we do need infrastructure like railway lines, but if you're not well, you can't catch a train. Okay, so it's got to be a balance. Now, there's no question uh, we support the industrial instruments that are around and people need to be paid proportionately and someone needs to recognise that nurses and uh, school teachers are completely underpaid relative to their contribution to the community. And then what's happening at the moment is a massive problem in, in, uh, in the public hospitals, all of which have an emergency department. So it sounds like Kirsten's environment there will be a one to four patient ratio. And that's very supported for all of the reasons it's very supportable. You go down to the emergency department, I haven't been recently into the Royal Children's Hospital, but I, I work at Monash Health, and there's a similar sort of children's hospital there. And you will have heard in the media this week, there was a very unfortunate event for an eight year old girl. That's, that's the place where I work. Now, what happens is in the emergency department, the nursing ratio is kind of 1 to 35, if you're lucky. And what we need to start thinking about in the immediate term are some short, shorter, sharper changes. So if I've hurt my ankle and I'm sitting in a wheelchair in the corridor being screamed at by a, psycho, a psychotic patient in the emergency department, I'm in the way. I could actually sit in my wheelchair up in Kirsten's ward um, because I'd still be in the way, but I'm not causing a 1 to 35 patient ratio in the emergency department. And that's when you're in the emergency department, because today every major emergency department has 15 ambulances outside with one patient in there, two ambulance officers. There's actually one, one and a bit ambulance officer because they're doubled up and volunteers and all that sort of thing. So this is good crisis management. It's what you'd want for the community to, to pull together. But if you need the next ambulance, you can't because they're parked outside the emergency department and nobody knows that you're there in the back of that ambulance, let alone that you're dying because we've had a few episodes of that as well. And if you say, you know, you're advised now it's going to take an hour and a half for the ambulance to turn up, so you, you get your neighbour or your partner or family member, drives you there and you're in the waiting room. The waiting room is invisible. Nobody knows you're there. And for example, if there's eight children who are eight years of age, how do you find the one who's dying? Because you haven't even assessed them. We haven't called Kirsten down from the road to use her years of experience to say, 
that's a sick kid. Bring him in. So these are the problems. So there's a problem tonight. There's a problem in a month. There's a problem in two years. And the budget, the Victorian government's budget, is looking to address into the early, medium, late, short term. We need to find something today and an EMR is not going to cut it. We need more help because every time the healthcare worker has their own mental health processes and every day somebody says, I just can't do this anymore. This isn't what I signed up for. I know I can do a whole lot better with the appropriate resources and this is just not what I want to be part of and I need a break. So we need to do something for tonight as well. Second one, yeah. I'll just, I just wanted to jump in um, before we go to the questions with something um, maybe a bit more positive in terms of what we learnt from the pandemic, which was I think the, the big success was that hospital in the home program where we saw, um, I mean, it saved our hospital system, let's be honest, and also in New South Wales, and it was trialled here in Victoria by the Royal Melbourne Hospital during the 2020, and so I put up my hand and go very proud of that um, and the team there that did that. Um, that really is, I think, one space where we learnt a lot about how we can increase capacity. I would stop, and this is a thought, in terms of how we're rolling that out going forward. So at the moment, I think the strategy is that every hospital sort of has this program. That's relatively inefficient. Um, there are hospitals in the US that are actually all virtual. Um, so you can set up a virtual hospital um, where you gain the expertise in terms of... Because the nature of care is obviously different. Um, the things you need to think about are different. And I do wonder whether, yes, Royal Melbourne Hospital did it very well and led by, you know, let's be honest, some of the world-leading emergency physicians globally. Um, but when you're asking for smaller hospitals to do that, whether that type of rollout in Victoria is going to get the same benefits or whether we need to be thinking, is the next hospital in Victoria a virtual hospital? Um, and so we think about the expertise that are behind that and how we might roll that out, how that may then integrate back to the hospitals where people are potentially being discharged from. It's not say it's not complex and, as I said, it's possibly a bit of a big idea, but I think at the moment it always concerns me when we do IT at this really granular level. Um, you're asking a lot of you know, individual hospitals uh, to carry that implementation. And it is quite, as we know, anyone who's been involved in an IT project <laughs> knows, you know, it, it's difficult. Uh, whereas if we looked more towards centralising that expertise, it might actually deliver a better outcome and more world-class care in terms of this hospital in the home. Thanks, Angela. I did promise um, questions from the floor. So I will um, open it up if people have questions. I might, there's a, we've got one microphone, a couple of microphones here, we'll figure out how to get them. If you could just introduce yourself and then ask your question, that'd be great. Hi everyone, thanks for being here today. Uh, my name's Lisa, I work in political and economic affairs at the US consulate. And um, you just mentioned uh, the United States, an all virtual hospital there. I was wondering what other jurisdictions, whether it's in Australia or around the world, do you see having models that um, are worth emulating? Uh, and then another question I have is um, around the really contentious conversations or conversations that aren't had f between people who have different views about vaccines and vaccine mandates. Um, I know in the United States that's um, raging and here as well. Um, and it seems like there's a, there's a lot of people just digging their heels in more to, to their different perspectives. So what are concrete actions we can take to move the conversation forward in a productive way and um, people who do have skepticisms to answer their questions, um, talk about scientific debate um, productively. Thank you. Oh, that's a hard one. <laughs> you can do the first half first. Um, I think, you know, there's obviously globally, and I, I, I pointing to the US is interesting, isn't it? Because I think as Australians, we often look at the US and think, oh, they're nuts, right? I mean, let's be honest. Like, um, and who would want to emulate their healthcare system? Because, you know, they spend so much money. But um, 
you know, there's a lot of innovation in the US. It's very expensive and it costs them a lot of money and, you know, they probably over-service and all those sort of things. But I think it is useful to look to there to see, well, what is best practice, what's actually worked. Um, and certainly, you know, there's a lot of innovation. Israel has also, I think, is, you know, sort of at the cutting edge of the hospital in the home um, type rollouts and, you know, has a very good healthcare system. So certainly there's examples overseas that we can look to um, that are doing this well. Uh, the vaccine question. Uh, look, I'll be honest, I, I probably am not the person to... Like, I avoid these... You know, I've got friends who are obviously um, vaccine hesitant. Um, it's difficult to engage. I think it's important not to demonise people... Uh, to understand fears, um, to empathise with those um, and to point out, you know, the factual <laughs> sort of the logical uh, implausibility of their claims. Um, but it's difficult. I mean, and I think, you know, going forward, it's this problem is not going to go away. As we're saying, you know, we need people to continue to be vaccinated, to stay protected um, and probably increasing and being vaccinated now for flu as well. Um, because our health system simply can't car carry this surge of hospitalisations. So, yeah, but I'm, I'm not a... Briefly touch on that second point. Um, yes, um, thank you. So I, I'll, I'll repeat what I said. The vaccines have been revolutionary in our ability to manage COVID-19. Now, so there's a couple of legs to, to your very reasonable comment. So absolutely, in the ideal world, I would sit down with a person for four hours and run through everything. I haven't gone four hours. You know, the pager goes, and that's the difficulty. What I, I can assure you, I've managed the patients who, you know, didn't want on the death certificate it was COVID-19 because they just didn't believe it existed. And part of that is the social media phenomenon in which we find ourselves and people becoming engaged in <laughs> black rabbit holes or, or all that weird sort of stuff. So if we had the resources and the time, we could sort of work our way through. Now, we have to be very honest. Some people got knocked around by the vaccines. And as a consequence, many people have had the two doses, which we ludicrously call fully vaccinated. You know, like if I'm going to drive to Perth and I fill up the tank and it, it's empty by the time I get to the South Australian border, I can't think, well, I had enough petrol to get me through to Perth. And that's the problem. The early vaccines, the the way the uh, the coronavirus works in our with our immune system, it wanes. That's why I say if you've had COVID, you might have four to six weeks of relative protection. You can probably still spread it, but you won't be that sick. So I'd love to go through and have the luxury of the time to go through all of those things, because some people had a bad experience with the two doses, the uh, booster, third dose they didn't want. And I'll, I'll repeat what I said earlier. We've got a phenomenally good vaccination rate. It's about 66% or two thirds. It's just not good enough because it's still whizzing around. Today, influenza is absolutely bashing the system. And so we have to encourage people to get the flu vaccine. The same people are often prepared to have the flu vaccine, but they don't want to have the corona vaccine. If I was a citizen in the United States, I'd be eligible for a fourth dose but I'm not because I don't fit the criterion in Australia, but I am looking after the people in the hospital, as is Kristen, who are presenting to the hospital with COVID-19. And I know that when I got my third dose as early as I could, because I was in that environment, my protection has waned. I don't qualify in Australia for another dose of the vaccine. And these are some of the difficulties related to right now. And there are people in my circumstances who say, I think I'll take that long service leave, which just means those people who are left have got a little bit more of a burden to deal with. Lots of moving parts. It's very, very complex. And we have so much information streaming. And the confusion, as I said, from business, you know, restaurants, travel, hospitality, feel for them. But it's a completely different message to the healthcare universe. I might just yeah. add to that first question. Um, so so we, we actually see that the UK health system has a lot of similarities to, to Australia. They've got the National Health Service there. 
and uh, we do a lot of work comparing notes with our colleagues over there. Th there was a campaign called Scan for Safety that they, they ran a trial on across six of their hospitals and they've recorded some really good data around the improvements in terms of the way they operated, uh, their ability to, to save money which could be freed up for other areas of healthcare and also uh, the improvement in both patient safety and the well-being of healthcare workers. Um, we can reference that and, and GS1, uh, Kath, who's actually on the same table with you, can maybe talk a little bit about some of the reports that are there. But we, we often do look to the UK because there's a bit more of a similarity to the Australian healthcare industry to, to versus the US, which is quite different. Uh, I'll just give, yeah, last question in the front. So hi, um, I'm Alana Phillips from Organon and I'm a medical advisor. So I just um, remember you talking about um, GPs being given the opportunity to do the vaccines for, for COVID-19 and taking some of the burden off. Um, primary care is also over overwhelmed at the moment. So I wanted a perspective from both you know, the AMA and uh, well, um, a specialist as well as from a nurse. What are your thoughts with regards to task shifting other um, things? For example, if I think about in the context of contraception, perhaps LARC insertion for the nurse to do that um, as opposed to the, the primary care physician to free up the primary care physician to to deal with other more, um, well, more challenging um, elements of care. So I'd, I'd like both the nurse perspective as well as the perspective from um, a, a specialist. Oh, I can um, really talk from a hospital perspective when we refer patients back to GPs, for example, for wound care. There's very competent practice nurses out there and practices where instead of us referring them to a GP for wound care, we could be referring them to the practice. But what's happening now is that people don't have GPs, so we can't refer them back to a GP for that wound care, so they're coming back into hospital. So how do we really have that nurse-led model of care, whether it's in hospital in our outpatient departments that stops us taking up the resources of the physicians or our clinicians, but also how do we engage with local practices to provide that care? Or can we have, we used to have district nurse, like that was privatised, we used to send district nurses out to provide wound care. Can that be part of our hospital in the home or our virtual care? From a paediatric perspective, we have parents that are capable of caring for their children. They care for their children every day. We used to teach them how to do wound care. We don't do that anymore. And I think we really need to look at the resources we have and use them much more wisely, but it has to be a shift in our thinking. Why is it the public hospital providing all the care? Where else can we provide that care for those families and children? Thank you. And um, I, I share the view. So interestingly, in many ways, what you've described is occurring, but the, the structural barriers to prevent that are broadly unbelievable, and you're, you're kidding. So there is the opportunity to do it, and if you have a large enough enterprise, the primary care groups can do exactly that. So it needs to be a team-based approach. And there is no question, say AMA Victoria as a policy, is very supportive of all of these outreach programs, particularly in mental health, but also for the physical health, as, as you've just heard described. Through the pandemic, a lot of people have met a GP for the first time because they've come from places where, what's a GP? I'm sick, I go to the hospital. And so that even that's been missing, so we'd hope those relationships continue. But equally, the GP doesn't have to do everything, but politically, I argue that there needs to be the engagement. So it's a team-based approach. It's a mini version of a hospital. I mean, it's not, it's not so hard. But the funding is catastrophic. So... I, I can't give you <laughs> one of those procedures unless I give it to you. I can't charge for any of the consultations in primary care talking about I'm worried will I have the third dose, the 18th dose of a vaccine, unless I'm eyeballing you. Now, we've, that's been a bit relaxed uh, related to digital and best visual, and they're great adjuncts, and we should be capitalising on all of that. But they're not the full answer. You know, sometimes you've got to put a hand on a person and say, yep, that's a real hard lump. We better do something about that. So it's just sitting down and sensibly building the structures to provide the health care that we want. Because last time I looked, it's, the it's well into the 21st century, and we're still sort of kind of the Dickensian type of approach. Time to move on. 
So we can capitalise on all of the digital media and opportunities, the data gathering and all of that, but you still need to have one-on-one -on -one communication. So some entrepreneurial types are attempting to do this. And that's what I said. When I, I deliberately said that the Victorian government funded practices to do the vaccination, they didn't pay for the vaccine, they didn't pay for that. They gave a dollop of money as the investment because it's illegal. And when I'm a patient enrolled in a hospital in the health program, our Prime Minister got up and said, oh, you've got COVID, tell your GP. Well, the GP actually didn't want to know because what are they going to do? They're, Thanks for sharing the news. Because <laughs> you're, you're a patient of the public hospital. Medicare agreement, out of date, but that's, you know, in parentheses. Uh, you're uh, funded from the hospital. I, I go to jail if I charge you for a consultation. And, you know, that's the environment. It is bananas. Mm -hmm. And so it goes right back to my early statement. This is an opportunity to really rework the system, which is what is required get the right person, the right place, the right environment, the right uh, infrastructure to give patient care. That's what we're all in it for. You know, the clinicians are in it for. All right, we are out of time, but Darren, last question very quickly, with a very quick response. Very quickly, uh, we've had a virtual Prime Minister for much of the last three years. The um, <laughs> How do we use, given the hesitancy, people said, effectively a lot of people said no to electronic health records when it was opt out, uh, vaccine hesitancy, even climate change, science itself, people seem to question. How can we use technology to convince people that this is actually the way forward? Because it seems like there's a bit of an impasse of really polarised opinions of believers and non-believers. How does the medical fraternity embrace that? And how do we use that as the next frontier? Anyone? Anyone? Um, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I seem to be speaking too much. But, um, it, it is tricky and it, it's a continuous process. So certainly within medicine, you throw out a hypothesis, you do an experiment, you see what's going on, you analyse the results and hopefully you're very honest about what that is. And, this is working, this isn't working. Gosh, look what happened when that happened. And so you pass it, and then you present the information because fundamentally, uh, you're responsible for your body. I can tell you the best technique for whenever you have anything, and then I'll start telling you what the risks are, and guess, out of the two of us, who's taking all the risks? So it really doesn't matter at the end, provided all of the information is accurate. And there's the rub because a large part of the time there's complete bunkum, complete rubbish coming from, you know, Kevin in Alaska. Like, you know, <laughs> why, why are people in Wontuna listening to Kevin in Alaska, you know? Or I, from possibly. Um, and so it's ultimately you provide the information. And look, I, I've met an awful lot of people, managed them for COVID-19, passionate anti-vaxxers, influencers, the whole thing, they've had it they completely change their tune, okay? And that's a terrible thing for anybody. I don't wish it on anybody, but when, when they go, Kevin lied to me, <laughs> it's, it's a revolution. <laughs> yeah, so I think um, the core for technology for any solution is making sure that um, there's visibility of, of how it's going to help. And uh, I think visibility and, and sharing information um, is probably the best way to communicate how you're going to make those improvements. Um, however, social media may be a challenge for that and um, we certainly don't have an answer for that one today. But I think overall, um, just making sure that there's that, that sense of what you're setting out to achieve when you're putting the technology in, the visibility that it's working and making sure it's well supported. And I think you touched on IT projects being challenging. Generally, in our experience, that's more about making sure that the right sort of consultancy is done first, make sure it's a proven solution, and making sure that there's a support system that's set up as well, which is certainly a trend that we've run into, is that there's a lot of systems out there where service and support is actually an afterthought, and then that becomes a real problem once the project's deployed as well. All right, we are absolutely out of time here today. Sorry, Angela, I can't let you say any more. Um, Thank you all for joining us. Uh, on behalf of the McKellen Institute, I really wanted to thank you for coming and participating. Um, these conversations only work when people um, come 
and listen and engage. And that's really what um, makes our job of stimulating debate about important public policy questions a whole lot easier as people like yourselves um, turning up. Um, we'll have more events over the course of the rest of the year, so please make sure um, you stay tuned to what they may be. I'd also like uh, you to join me in thanking our panellists here today, to Kirsten, Roderick, Angela and Brett. Um, great conversation, interesting topics, some challenging views, so um, we really appreciate uh, you all here. There's some sandwiches left. Um, please make sure you eat them um, and uh, we'll see you all next time. Thanks very much. <laughs>